Please stand in body or in spirit for the reading of the gospel. Luke 6, 17 through 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him to be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him and from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, when they revile you and defame you on the account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Even after working for 12 years in the Delta, Janae Jones Tisby was surprised. She had served for three years as a Teach for America volunteer, and then continued to teach for nine more years, and the last three of those, she has been appointed by the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship as the director of the Together We Hope program that addresses rural poverty in America, Uh, and she's located in Arkansas. Actually, you should know that our former missions minister, Jason Coker, oversees that entire program, And just this week, Blake Tommy, who grew up in our church, wrote a story about all of this that I'm actually referring to. Well, Janae took her fifth grade class to a Mid-South mansion in Memphis called the Pink Palace Museum. The kids were all agog. They pulled up to this big pink granite building past blooming ruby red tulips and a beautiful morning sunlight striking the whole place. And inside they were promised that they were going to get to see the Canyon Diablo meteorite, count the vertebrae in a giraffe's neck, and meet Stan, the 40-foot Tyrannus Rex. Tyrannosaurus Rex. I'm not good at this. <laughs> anyway, it's a skeleton. <laughs> Just so you know, in case there was any question, Jurassic Park and all that, right? All right, so Miss Tisby, then at a certain point, she, was, she led them up to the second floor to see other things in the exhibit past this lobby with Stan, you understand. And Uh, and she became aware that no one was following her. So she turned around to see that all the kids were still down on the first floor, frozen in place at the base of the escalator. You see, Um, none of her students had ever seen or ridden an escalator before. Some were terrified of it. Others were so excited they wanted to ride it up and down over and over again. Most just continued taking ride after ride as Stan and his Mansion of Wonders took a back seat to the marvels of the mechanical moving stairs. It seems small and silly, Tisby explains, but it's a perfect illustration of the lack of opportunity that children in poverty face. Telling fifth graders in the Delta 
to imagine a better future is like telling them to imagine the ocean when the biggest body of water that they have ever seen is a catfish pond or a river. You can take that analogy on and on. It's so much harder for a child to say, I want this or I can do this when he or she can't see it or it seems really far away. That escalator is really tiny, but it illustrates to me, she says, how difficult it can be for a kid to dream into what he or she actually wants or to even know what to dream in the first place. Friends, this is America. 2019, the richest country in the world, a nation that loves to call itself exceptional, be, be, exceptional because we say that we define ourselves by our ideals, not by the social predestination of blood and soil nations, right? And yet there are millions of children among us who still have never seen an escalator which to me is a metaphor of how some of us take for granted that there are systems that move for us and that help us to climb while other people have to work harder to travel the same distance. The income gap is an opportunity gap. The opportunity gap is an imagination gap. The imagination gap is an aspiration gap. The aspiration gap is an achievement gap. And so it goes on and on. Right. And this can't be the dream of God for the world that rich and poor should live side by side at neighbors with such a different experience of life, right? Well, early in his ministry, Jesus leads his disciples to a broad plain. It was a level place, Luke tells us. And that's such a suggestive phrase, I think. A level place, because it will become a leveling place in just a moment. Right? People from all over come to the level place. People from down in the southeast where Judea and Jerusalem are, all of them Jews most likely. People from the northeast, which would be uh, where Tyre and Sidon is, mostly Gentiles. These would be the enemies of the Jews. They all arrive together in this broad plain, this place, although if some of the Jews could have had their way, they would have built a wall to keep those other folks out. But they get there anyway, and they have to be together. They have to be. Because this is about all of them coming. Everybody. That's a big theme for Luke. We didn't just make that up here at Wilshire, you know. They all come, some to hear, some to heal, some to be raised to gain a share in the life that God intended, some to be lowered to gain a share in the life that God intended. They know he has wonder-working power. Not like the politicians who promise but can't deliver or won't. People come to that place and they see each other eye to eye. No matter where they came from or their circumstances, high or low, by the time Jesus is done with them, they see themselves as equals in a new community. And then Jesus speaks to his disciples. Actually, he looks up to them to speak to him, to them. When Matthew records Jesus teaching these Beatitudes, he wants us to remember Moses having come down from the mountain, and so he tells us about these teachings with authority from the Sermon on the Mount. But when Luke tells us about 
Jesus' teaching, he brings us to a level place. Jesus is down with the people. This is the Sermon on the Plain, see? And he is so far down with them that he even looks up to them. Think of it. The divine Son of God has come down and so identified with the lowly and their sense and experience of lowliness that he knows what they feel. There is one difference, though. He knows something from God that sustains him, and he has no intention of keeping it secret. And so from this level place, he proclaims the good news of God in the form of blessings and woes. Now, you heard me right. I said he proclaims the good news to rich and poor alike. This is different, though, than what we hear today that amounts so often to class warfare. Whether against the poor by the rich or against the rich by the poor, and yes, it goes both ways. You know, right now in our country, we hear an awful lot of people scorning one another over whether they are free market capitalists or socialists, right? Never any nuance in the criticism, you understand. That would be too sporting, don't you know? You know? Only the grossest of characterizations. So we take aim at the wealthy and the politicians who support them. We criticize their tax policies that amount to corporate welfare, and we paint them all as pure evil. Robber barons, the lot of them, off with their heads. You know. They steal from the poor, they give nothing back but a little charity to save their consciences. Never mind that many of them really worked hard and studied hard to get where they are, took a lot of risks at times with their lives, even if they did have a leg up to start with. Never mind, they are job creators who make it possible for a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have a job to have one, to feed their families. We only pick out the worst features of the wealthy and say, woe to you who are rich. On the other side, the rich caricature the poor as lazy and resentful. They always want something for nothing. Welfare queens and the like, you know. They would tax the rich so mercilessly, it would take all the incentive out of striving to get ahead. And beneath the criticism is the sneaking suspicion that the poor are poor, really, you know, because they are bad. Right? They lack the virtues necessary to succeed. And when you keep scratching that a little deeper, you might find that the rich actually believe God has blessed them because of who they are and cursed the poor because of who they are. Really, woe to you who are poor. That's our way. And we end up with a politics of resentment that is nothing more than a tug of war between groups of people who believe there's only so much to go around. Everything you give up is being stolen from you because it's rightfully yours. And everything you get is only right because it should have been yours by rights all along. Jesus has another way that levels us out and creates a true sense of community if we would only heed his words. At first reading, it may sound like he's singing the same old class warfare song because he actually uses words to talk about the most extreme examples of poor and rich. There are two words in the Greek that refer to the poor, and one of them is about the working poor. That's not the one he uses. He uses the one about beggars, the abject poor who can't take care of themselves. And when he talks about the rich, he doesn't just mean people with some resources. He means the mega-rich. He means, well, he uses a word that gives us the word plutocracy, right? That is to say, those who are the super rich, that are the ruling class, that you understand. 
And most of us live between these two extremes, don't we? It's easy to just dismiss them at the edges. But here's the thing, Jesus does that not to lump us all in one or the other so much as to teach us that we actually have a choice as to which way our hearts turn. See? See, you have to ask yourself when you read this, is Jesus pronouncing a final judgment on the rich and a final blessing on the poor? Or does he see the possibility that people all along this continuum can change? Keen listeners would have heard echoes of Moses from the book of Deuteronomy. See, before the children of Israel entered the promised land, Moses preached to them about how they should not build a way of life together that's like the way of the Egyptians that they left behind. And he proclaimed blessing and woes on them as promises and warnings. Choose life was the essence of his message. And this is what Jesus is saying too. You can choose. And the amount of money and stuff we have Jesus is saying, is not the same thing as life. This is why he says, blessed are the poor, because theirs is the kingdom of God. They already have it. And woe to the rich, because they have already received their consolation. The poor are not blessed with God's favor because they are poor. They are blessed with God's favor because God is all they've got. They understand how needy they are. And the woe to the rich is because the rich have a tendency to think they don't need anyone or anything, including God. They actually struggle because everybody wants to be their friend and they actually have to work to not let people get too close because of what they might take from them if they do. The sad goal of the rich is often to be so completely self-sufficient that they need no one, they can be completely isolated, they can completely take care of themselves, and that will leave them friendless and lonely. You may be full now, but your stuff will not take care of the real emptiness inside you. You may laugh now, but tears will come. That's part of what being human is. Everyone may speak well of you now, but whose blessing is really important. This is what he's saying. When Jesus says rich and poor, by the way, he doesn't actually just mean money. I mean, that would be too limiting. In our society, there are all sorts of people who are rich and poor in different ways. The rich also means white privilege, male privilege, straight privilege, Christian privilege. In other words, me, (laughs) people just like me. But we've got to stop feeling people like me, people like a lot of us, like we're victims when we hear words like these from Jesus. We've got to learn to receive them as really good news. There's hope for us too. We can choose to turn from his woes to blessing. Wilshire hosted Room in the Inn again Friday night. This uh, program was started by our intrepid uh, mission and advocacy minister, Heather Mustaine. We are the only church in Dallas to do it to this point. Please tell your friends, we need many more. During the winter and summer months when the elements are most severe, and the shelters are bursting, we welcome homeless people into our church for a night. Ten homeless women from the Austin Street Shelter came to spend the night here Friday, and about two dozen Wilshire members were here with them, eating together, talking, singing together. The women always leave us feeling better about themselves and more hopeful about what is possible for them because they feel human again. They feel seen. They feel loved and worthy, not judged. But that's only half the story. 
See, the other half is what happens to the rich, that is us, <laughs> because of all of this. If you talk to our members who help, they will tell you what it means to them, the joy and friendship that they feel when they are participating, the sense that they get to share in the blessing of God that the poor enjoy, and it turns them toward each other. This happens every time we give generously of our money, our time, ourselves. And it isn't just limited to charity. It also goes to advocating politically for a more just society, not by demonizing others, but by calling upon the better angels of their nature, as Lincoln put it. And you know what, Dallas is the perfect city to model this leveling way of Jesus because there are a lot of people who call themselves Jesus people in Dallas. And it is the most unlevel city in America. So see, it's perfect. We can practice that right here. There's an old shaker song called Simple Gifts that our choir from time to time sings, and because he heard it in the early service, Jeff was riffing off it during the children's moment. I got it. I, I, I heard you. <laughs> Very good, Jeff. This is what he does. But it really sums up the joy of leveling out that Jesus calls us to. Tis a gift to be simple. Tis a gift to be free. Tis a gift to come down where I ought to be. And when I am in the place just right, I will be in the valley of love and delight. Yeah. Amen.